just a bit outside. Welcome to another episode of Nate Hit the Foul Pole. I'm Zach Goodman, here with Matthew Pine. How you doing today, Matt? Fantastic. Don't want about day 17 of quarantine, but pretty pretty good so far. Yep, uh, everyone's standing inside their houses. It's a great time to listen to podcasts, and uh, especially a good time to listen to baseball, considering yesterday was supposed to be opening day. And uh, yeah, so another baseball season that should have started yesterday didn't because of coronavirus, obviously. Everyone is aware of the situation. There's a lot of consequences for the baseball season that are resulting of coronavirus. So, obviously, the draft, the start date, everything like that. So, service times and other things. So, Matt, what's your take on all of this? Yeah, I mean, it just seems like the timeline has shifted so much. Uh, we hear from Scott Boris that they still want to have a 162 game season that goes until Christmas. I don't exactly know how that would work if there's a team like the Minnesota Twins. Uh, playing in the playoffs, and they have to play in Minnesota in the wintertime. But, yeah, I mean, you get that news. You get the news that the draft's going to be five rounds, and we'll talk about that more with our guest. They agreed upon a CBA deal. It's just it's, it's a lot going on right now in the baseball world. Yeah, and, and Bob Nightingale reported today that the latest MLB wants to go is Thanksgiving, but knowing MLB and the coronavirus situation going on, there is not much certainty on anything, so I wouldn't really take anyone's word for anything right now. It's kind of an up-in-the-air situation. Um, I'd personally love to see a Christmas World Series. I think it'd be really entertaining, maybe down in Miami or Tampa Bay. or I mean, they could plant in a spring training facility, anywhere where they can really just get this done. And I think anywhere where we can really just start this baseball season as fast as possible and as safely as possible is the best option for us right now. Yeah, I mean, that would be interesting how that whole, like, that whole off season would work because if they play late into December, there's players going to have to come back in February, like right away for spring training. I mean, I don't really think that would be the case, but... Yeah, we might see a, a restructured schedule for next season, too. Maybe more double headers uh, starting in May or something as opposed to starting in March or April. So, yeah, I think this is going to have long-lasting consequences on you know the next few seasons and... Uh, a lot of players will be affected by this, too. Obviously, Jeff Passan was talking about service time and how that's going to be affected. It really screws over a lot of teams. The Orioles aren't a team where we really have to worry about this right now. But teams like the Dodgers are really affected because Mookie Betts, they just traded two top prospects for him. And now they might not even get him at all because of service time. It's just going to be exactly what 2019 service time was. So Mookie Betts may not play a single inning for the Dodgers. And they just lost top two prospects for him. So I think this is going to have a lot of, like I said before, consequences for teams. And Mookie Betts, I think, is one of the biggest ones considering his stature. And I think the Dodgers definitely have a good opportunity to get him back in 2021. But as of right now, the service time and the way that's going to work out is really going to hurt a lot of players and a lot of teams. Yeah, I mean, I just feel like there's so much uncertainty right now. I mean, even the NFL is talking about possibly their season being interrupted by this, and they don't they don't play until September, so it's really just hard to say. I mean, you can put a hard deadline on some things, which is good to give some fans comfort and all that, but it's not necessarily going to play out that way. But you know, you just got to take it a day at a time, a week at a time. And uh, Rob Manfred, you know, he gets a lot of flack, so we'll see how the, he he handles this whole situation in the end. Yeah, I definitely think Manfred has handled this better than he has in the past with other situations. But, um, you know, we, we suspended the uh, season on the same day that all the other professional sports leagues did, a day after the NBA, though. Um, yeah, I, I don't think he's handled this badly. He definitely has done a lot worse in a lot of other areas. Um, I think that players coming to a de deal with the MLB yesterday was really important and a milestone. And I don't think we know the full deal yet. I don't know if we know all of this, but the players voted on it, and I guess if the players are voting on it, and whatever this includes, start date, draft, etc., it has to be decent, because the players are not going to vote on something they wouldn't like. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of one of those scenarios where, you know, you damned if you do, you damned if you don't. I mean, you get the full year of service time, but the whole, am I going to get paid for this season? That's, that's going to be another situation. Um, obviously, I feel for all of the stadium employees that won't be 
employed until potentially July or later, uh, especially if they have no fans in July. Um, but it seems like, you know, not to be too much of a, a pun here, but these teams are stepping up to the plate and um, they're, they're providing some relief. I know a few teams have done this and across all the sports leagues. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough situation. It's unprecedented, but you got to kind of just be smart and you got to just roll with the punches. Yeah, and definitely the fastest way that we can get back to baseball safely is the best way. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of players are going to be really unhappy because they're not getting paid, like you said. And uh, uh, Jeff Passan actually reported yesterday that owners are giving players an $170 million advance for April and May. Um, so that's pretty decent, I guess. Maybe everyone's not going to get their full amount of money they should have received. But at least MLB, I think, right now is stepping up and doing the right things to make this – I guess, a decent experience for both the players and the fans. Um, and speaking of the experience of the fans, what were your thoughts on the opening day at home yesterday where they showed historical games for every team and maybe the, the best game, a playoff game, opening day? What did you think about that? I was not entirely impressed. Yeah, I think we uh, spoke a little bit about this yesterday. I was um, I was impressed by the the outpouring of support the Orioles Twitter gave. I mean, that was it was really nice to see. It's like you're watching a live game that happened six years ago. But um, yeah, I wasn't I wasn't really tuned in. I was kind of doing my own thing. I know we we've talked about this, but I'm not like a big time. I'm gonna rewatch this game type guy. I like to see things live. I like to anticipate something that I haven't seen before. That kind of adds to the suspense of watching a, a live game. Um, so it wasn't for me, but a lot of people seem to enjoy it. Yeah, I say I wasn't impressed because of a lot of the reasons that you know you said too. But uh, yesterday for the Orioles, it was ALDS Game 2, 2014, against the Detroit Tigers, the Delman double game. Everyone knows it. If you're an Orioles fan, it's basically the greatest game in our history, one of the greatest games in our history. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of people enjoyed reliving the experience, as you said. And uh, Orioles Twitter was the most alive it's been since, like, a couple years, to be honest with you, because these past years, Orioles Twitter has been pretty dead. But, um, yeah, I, I think that I would love to see MLB just do some other things that aren't replaying old baseball games. Definitely some other ways to get fans more involved right now while we can't do anything. Um, I'd love to see them do some, like, giveaways and everything. Um, you know, ways to get fans involved right now because there is no live baseball, but uh, there's not a lot going on in the sports world right now. So <laughs> playing old baseball games wasn't it for me. Yeah, um, not my thing, but I guess that I, that kind of leads me to my next point. Like, this is going to, like, just talking, like, logistics and how it's going to turn out economically, like, this is going to hurt small market teams that rely on these TV deals for their revenue. I mean, there is revenue sharing. That's a thing. And obviously these small market teams don't always draw a huge crowd, but when they don't, I don't know how this works really, to be honest with you, but when they don't have these games playing every single night during the summer and Orioles games, as bad as they are to watch the last couple of years, it's still the number one ranked show on TV in the summertime in the Baltimore Metro area. What are they going to be doing for revenue? I mean, this could this could have far-reaching effects past just this season. Yeah, and a lot of teams are going to be who share TV deals, like the Orioles and the Nationals. I think the Nationals will probably get upset as they usually do about TV mm -hmm. deals, and they'll probably charge us two hundred million dollars or some outrageous number, like they usually do. Yeah. Um, that's a never-ending saga. But yeah, I think another thing is minor league teams. Um, I don't know if a minor league season without fans is even feasible. Because you know you have the operating costs of these stadiums, you have you know you have to pay the players. It's not really going to be easy for a lot of minor league teams. There's not a lot of income. They don't have super rich owners like Peter Angelos. They are you know most of them I should say. Um, they are independent, and a lot of them are going to struggle without fans this season. Yeah, I mean I I saw a couple of videos on some of these smaller towns because that's like their only revenue source the entire year like there was a case study of this town in western massachusetts and um they were on the cut list for one of the minor league teams to be cut and they actually met state of massachusetts passed a bipartisan um 
bipartisan uh, legislation that basically forced the team to stay in Western Massachusetts. That's huge for that team. I mean, look at the Frederick Keys. That they provide as much of an economic impact as the Preakness does to the state of Maryland. So, I mean, that's going to be huge for some of these like smaller town, um, you know, sparsely populated areas where that's all they rely on, and they're going to lose this. And it's just sucks. I mean, it sucks for the area as a whole, but it sucks for those employees. It sucks for the fans going to those games, and just a messy situation all the way around. As a friend of the podcast, Chris Resitor noted yesterday uh, in, a, in a personal message, he said that the MLB kicking out 42 teams from the minor leagues is almost a nail in the coffin now for all 42 teams, um, you know, including the Frederick Keys, obviously. This coronavirus situation has made it almost official now which is just, like you said, it's it's really terrible for a lot of communities. And Frederick is not one that goes off of minor league baseball revenue as a whole. Uh, they have some other great things there. But, yeah, a lot of small towns are really going to suffer from this. And it puts a lot of people out of jobs, too. Not only not only the players, but the front office staffs, the game day staff. So, yeah, I think this is going to be have far-reaching effects. Um, coronavirus is definitely going to be taking some things that were just possibilities now and making them reality. So um, I think this is something we're just going to have to monitor. Um, nothing's set in stone yet, but mostly it's going to happen down the road as far as MLB kicking out some minor league teams. Yeah, and uh, one final point. You know, obviously this is an Orioles podcast. There's bigger things out there right now than sports. But we just like to provide our audience with a little bit of an escape. You know, it helps you. It helps me. Uh, sports have always been a, a good outlet for that, and we just hope that provides, you know, 30 minutes out of your day, just a little bit of an es- escape. Yeah, and we'll be here every week um, to give a little bit of entertainment, and uh, we're going to always have that Orioles content coming at you, so uh, look out for that. And we'll have more extra innings episodes as well, so uh, yeah, we're going to do yep. this until the season starts, and then we'll start with our weekly updates and everything like that, so uh, yeah, we're looking forward to it. Yeah, we will uh, do some more. I think we're going to do some more film breakdown in the future, like we did the Nate McLeod hitting the foul ball in the playoff game. We'll do some more. Uh, maybe we'll look at the Delman Young play. Maybe we'll look at some other plays. Um, Stevie Wilkerson save. Who knows? Who knows what we got up our sleeve? You just got to wait and find out. But I think we're going to kick it over to our interview with Baseball America's Carlos Colazzo. <music> We now welcome in Carlos Colazzo. You can follow Carlos on Twitter at Carlos A. Colazzo. He is a national writer for Baseball America. Carlos, welcome to the show. How's it going, guys? Thanks for having me. It's going pretty well. Pretty well. Yeah, so uh, the news came down, I believe it was yesterday, two days ago, that the draft, the MLB draft 2020, would be a little bit reshuffled, a little reformatted. Can you just take us through the basic changes that were made? Yeah, definitely. So at this point, we are going to have a draft, which is good news for anyone who uh, was a little worried from those AP reports that came out a while ago that the draft could be canceled. That's not going to happen uh, under these new conditions that the MLB Players Association and MLB agreed to. uh, The draft could be shortened to at minimum five rounds, um, but the round length is yet to be determined. It will be decided upon by team owners at some point closer to the draft date. We'll have about a month notice. when the draft's going to actually happen. Uh, but it's probably going to be five to ten rounds. After that, undrafted free agents can sign for $20,000. That's the max cap. Um, so it's going to be quite a bit different than we've seen ever, really. It's not a great it's not a great sign for potential draftees. This is going to push a lot of high school players to college. This is going to cut out a lot of junior draft uh, players in college who might have been in that kind of $150,000 to $300,000 signing bonus range. Uh, and it's also going to create uh, a bit of a predicament for college seniors as well, depending on how the NCAA decides on eligibility, which that'll happen for the Division One Council next Monday, I believe. So still some wrinkles left to, to kind of be settled, but it'll be very different than any draft I've ever covered and that we've ever seen. And say that a the coronavirus issue is still a huge issue in July when the draft is supposed to take place. Do you think that the agreement could change and they push it back a little bit more? I, I don't think they should push it back, and I think I think in the agreement it said the latest it would happen is late July. 
So I think that's the latest that could happen. And if, like, you can do the draft remotely. There's no need for everyone to gather around. We already do days two and three on a conference call. If we had to day one, the first round, it could be on a conference call as well. So the draft, the draft picks can happen. It would be more detrimental, I think, to college baseball, to the draftees, to the teams, to push it back even later than July. There are too many logistical things that I personally think would get in the way if you did that. So I expect it to happen uh, before the end of July. Yeah, maybe you can clarify some of the the details. Is it possible that you could see some of these smaller market market teams like the Orioles passing on premium talent if they say they only offer a deferred payment? What do you mean as far as the deferred payment? Is that is it possible? Like if they say we're going to give you partial bonus of your bonus now, mm-hmm. and in twenty twenty one we can recoup the rest of it? Or I'm not really sure if the details have been worked out yet. Yeah, so you can actually, if you guys are listening and you want to check out more of these details, J.J. Cooper actually did a really thorough like, kind of outline of all the details. But the way the bonuses are going to work this year is that I think uh, everyone will get $100,000 um, on draft day. You get that up front. The 50, 50% of the remaining bonus, you get paid July of 2021. And then 50% of the, the then remaining after that, or I guess whatever the whatever's left remaining, you get paid on July 1st, 2022. So all the bonuses are going to be deferred in this draft regardless, and I'm pretty sure there's no negotiating that. Gotcha. Uh, So do you expect premium talent like Spencer Torkelson or Austin Martin to sign if a team decides to try to pay them less money if they draft them high? Oh, I think those guys are probably in good good position. I mean, there would be no reason for a team to try and undercut those guys. They're the premium talents in the draft it's anything you're going to want to overpay them like they're getting their money they're elite talents for a reason if a team is going to try and play games with that they're going to miss out on the best talent in the draft so i think there's a chance that at least at the top of this year's draft you could see it play more in line with what the consensus is on the talent similar to the nfl and the nba where everything is kind of hard slotted there's no negotiating the contracts um, but towards the end, when you kind of get to the, the fourth and the fifth round, if it does end up being five rounds, I mean, then you'll have players deciding whether they'd like an under slot deal in the fifth for, let's say, I don't know what the slots would be, for like $100,000. That's better than the $20,000 you are going to get if you go undrafted. Uh, and then you'll have to weigh that 20000 with going back to school, competing in a, a loaded college class with all the players who are going to be not stuck in college but forced to college. Uh, so things could get dicey at the back end, but I think the impact talents you're talking about at the top end should be fine. Yeah, and as a follow-up to that, I mean, are, are we going to see a rash of high schoolers, you know, skipping this draft and saying, you know, I'm not really going to sign. I want to um, I want to showcase more in college if I can't play my full senior season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think it's um, – I think for a lot of these guys, they know their talent, and, and for all these teams, they've scouted the high school guys, particularly the ones – the high-profile guys who were at all the showcase events last summer, I don't think it's a question of whether they need to kind of improve their stock, but it's a question of in this um, in this draft system, will they be paid to the level they think they should be paid? And if the answer is no, they're going to head to college, uh, maybe come back in 2022 if they've drafted a little sophomores or 2023, and hopefully the system is a little bit more settled and they'll be, they'll be able to negotiate bonuses that are more in line with what their talent is and what, what the market rate should be, although it's a suppressed market rate, so it's always tricky. But to simply answer your question, yeah, there are going to be a lot of high school players who otherwise would have been drafted. They're going to go to the college level, the JUCO level, uh, and try it in future years. And do you think teams that are at least high up will try to target college players more than high school players? for the reason that there are only five rounds in this draft? I think there's some logic to that. I mean, there are a lot of high school players that didn't get to throw at all this year. Mick Abel is a guy out of the Northwest, so I think he only threw a couple bullpens. Nick Bitsko is another high-profile first-round caliber arm for us, who reclassified from 2021 and is now 2020. So last summer, teams were under the assumption they had a, a full another year with him, uh, and he didn't really get going this year. So... I think there is a lot of sense to be made in saying, okay, we have a lot more history. We've got a lot more track record. We've got better analytics and statistics for these college guys. Um, And you could say we feel more comfortable that we want to go with the college guys. I think that's part of the reason why a lot of these high school players will get pushed out. Uh, There will be some teams who still want to take take a chance on the talent and are a little less risk-averse than some other teams. Seems like the Padres 
are a team that, that definitely has done that in the past. Um, and I think there are enough elite high school talents um, that should be okay. I would imagine they are. I don't think everyone's going to run away from them um, because a lot of these guys have, have pretty much established themselves over the past year, year or two. Um, so the top end guys should be okay outside of maybe some of the northern players. Um, but, yeah, once you get further down the line, it, it gets riskier and riskier. Yeah, I was definitely assuming that teams would be looking at safer picks as opposed to the high school guys that have maybe more upside but definitely a higher mm-hmm. chance to bust. Um, if you had to guess on a date for the draft, where would you think we're going to go? Uh, I don't have a specific date. Uh, personally, I think the sooner you do it, the better. It just gives all the college coaches a chance to kind of get their rosters in order. Uh, let the JUCO guys who are thinking about transferring and, and deciding where they're going, let them kind of make their decisions. Um, in my mind, like you, you delay it because you want to get a few more looks. Um, potentially, you could have a couple showcases, but if the virus continues and you, you can't have gatherings, you can't have showcases, you're delaying it really for no reason in my mind. So I would rather just stick to the current schedule, have the draft around June 10th, um, and go from there. Uh, because the, the one benefit of delaying it is, like I said, you, you maybe get a showcase or you get some looks from guys playing in workouts, and I don't necessarily know at this point if that's going to happen or not. So I would say you just go ahead and make the draft. Everyone's going to be operating with the same information as far as the teams are concerned. Uh, and, and all of them that I've talked to are confident in the information they have. They, they feel like they can make quality picks at this point. So I'd, I'd say we should probably just go ahead and do it. Yeah, okay. So uh, one last question for you here. Do you think rebuilding clubs like the Marlins or the Mariners or the Orioles will end up having a worse draft? Will they be affected in their rebuilds because of this draft? Yeah, I think everyone's going to have a worse draft. I mean, there's just fewer players that are going to be able to get fewer impact talent across the board. So if you, if you really needed that impact in your system now, it kind of sucks that this is when you're picking um, I mean, this is a very deep class. It would be a great class to, you know, be aggressive on the third day like the, the Braves and the Dodgers were last year, but those teams spent upwards of $2 million on the third day, and I think this would be an excellent class to kind of target that and, and, and implement that strategy. There are just so many good players. Um, now, obviously, you got to have the, the money to sign them. There's no guarantee that you're going to, and you still have to hit on the right guys. But, yeah, I do think that that is unfortunate for those teams. It's going to stall – if you hit right, you can still do a really good job. Let's say you have 10 rounds and you hit on five guys. That's the goal. Um, you could still do really well for yourself. I'm not saying that's impossible to, but it's going to be a lot more difficult um, to get the impact talent that you want in your system. But at the top end, I think, like I said earlier, the top end talent, your first few picks, you should still feel pretty good about them either way. Yeah, and I think the Orioles will be able to grab a premium talent like maybe Spencer Torkelson that we might be looking at at the top of the draft to bolster our farm system that is up and coming. We give our thanks to Carlos Colazzo from Baseball America. Give, give him a follow on Twitter, and you can follow him and learn more about the MLB draft coming up. Thanks, Carlos. Yeah, guys, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it, man. Okay, that was our interview with Baseball America's Carlos Colazzo talking about the upcoming 2020 MLB draft. Gave some great insight there. And before we get out of here, Zach, we would just like to discuss a couple recent cuts that the Orioles have made. Yeah, so they cut Ryan Mountcastle, Ramon Urias, David Hess, and Cedric Mullins. Um, Probably not too surprising on either of the four, but, um, you know, I really was hoping Urias to make the team a personal favorite of mine. Uh, You know, it would have been nice to see Cedric make the team, but he didn't really perform. Mountcastle was only hitting the 230s, um, and David Hess... I think we all knew the deal on David Hess. Uh, he didn't get any better, so I'm not too shocked by any of these. I would have liked to seen a couple of those guys make the team, but this is not really too groundbreaking. Um, I'm definitely not shocked by three out of the four. I'm a little shocked by Urias, but you knew Mountcastle wasn't making it with the uh, service time. You probably knew Cedric Mullins wasn't going to make it because he's still got to work on a swing, prove it a little bit before he comes back up. And David Hess is David Hess. I mean, I love him. I'm rooting for him. He's a great guy. I hope he's figured something out, especially went good. he went to the same academy as uh, John Means did this offseason, so maybe it helped him out a little bit. But, yeah, nothing nothing too, uh, too new to report on the O's front. Yeah, and I'd just like to make a note that anybody we talk about in here and anything we say negative, we're obviously all rooting for these guys. They're Orioles. We love them, so... 
All right, so that about does it for this week's and Nate hit the foul pole. Uh, as our good buddy Justin Labor at War from Forty Four would say, stay indoors, practice social distancing, be smart. Let's flatten this curve and let's get some baseball that we can watch in a few months. As always, you can follow us on Twitter at Foul Pole Pod. You can listen to us on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, on iTunes, and on SoundCloud. And please shoot us a review or a five star rating on iTunes. We greatly appreciate it. It helps our clout, as the kids would say, helps the clout. And uh, we will talk to you next week. 